Hey, how's it going guys? This is Nigel here and welcome back to Science Explained. Today, we will be taking a look at the future of space travel. In episode 4 and 5, we've been wandering at the past and exploring the things that has already existed. But today, ladies and gentlemen, we are taking a look at the future, which is vastly unpredictable. However, we can predict something based on directions us humans are going. So, without further ado, let's dive into the topic then. Based on my speculations, in the future, humans might still stick to chemical propulsion and iron propulsion for at least 20 years or so. But us humans are already working on something that might push us one step up into so-called Type 1 civilization on the Kardashev scale, which means to harness all the energy that falls on a planet from its parent star. I know, it sounds all fancy and stuff, but actually us humans are already on 0.73 on the Kardashev scale. And in order to achieve Type 1 civilization, which is 1 on the Kardashev scale, we might need 100-200 years of further development, according to scientists called Mikio Kaku. But I don't think so. With the development of nuclear fusion, humans can achieve type 1 civilization in around 70 years. But you might ask, how is that related to space travel? Well, if you've seen my nuclear fusion video, which you definitely should, you should know that nuclear fusion is extremely powerful and efficient, although currently us humans can only achieve a fusion energy gain factor representing Q of 0.67, which means the energy outcome of the reaction is two thirds of the energy put into the device. Not the best, I know. But when humans actually master the technique of nuclear fusion, which might take a good 50 years or so, it is estimated that space travel will advance into so called low speed age. Nuclear fusion has a huge potential for space travel since not only because it is powerful and efficient, it also lasts very long and the fuel can be obtained from gaseous planets such as Jupiter, which means they can refuel during interstellar travels, which is a good thing. There are already plans made for nuclear fusion powered spaceships as early as 1973. It is called Project Daedalus. Of course this plan never made it out of the drawing board, but it sounds pretty impressive and not too hard to achieve. It is a two-stage rocket, which will be assembled in orbit, both carries nuclear fusion fuels. The first stage weighs approximately 1,690 tons, which is about 12 Saturn V launches, not too much. But we have not counted the propellant mass, which is a staggering 46,000 tons. Quite difficult to live into orbit, but let us assume that we have completed the challenge and the first stage has been lifted into orbit, fully fueled and ready to go. Now, the second stage, 980 tons empty shell and plus 4000 tons of fuel, will be no problem lifting to orbit, I assume. And the payload, 450 tons, nothing compared to the first and second stage. So, the spaceship is now assembled and ready to go. The first stage fires for a good two years, boosting the speed to about 7% light speed, which is actually quite fast considering currently humans can't even reach 0.1% light speed. Then the first stage will separate in order to shed weight, and the second stage will fire for 1.76 years, boosting the speed to 12% light speed, which is even faster. And you can reach Alpha Centauri in just about 40 years or so. The spacecraft is planned to use a special type of nuclear fusion called inertial confinement fusion, which means shooting jets of laser at the fuel, which heats it up to do fusion work and propel the spacecraft forward. Even though this plan sounds very unrealistic, this type of propulsion system is still to be expected in 50 years or so. Another potential vehicle powered by nuclear fusion is called Busset Ramjet. Like a ramjet, it's only effective when it's at a high speed. The way it works is although the space is so called vacuum and actually has a very small concentration of particles, namely hydrogen and helium. A busted ramjet collects these particles in various ways and use it as fusion fuel to accelerate the vehicle. Of course, it will be needing very large areas for collection of particles, so it is planned to use 
the electromagnetic field is more than a mile in radius to collect these particles for fuel. The busted ramjet is actually not a new concept. This concept was proposed in the 60s and by, obviously, a guy named Robert Bussett. But although by the sound of it, this project is quite nice, but it might not be practical for space travel since operating giant electromagnetic shields also requires lots of power. Other than nuclear fusion, antimatter can also be used as a way of accelerating a vehicle to a high speed, and this type of a propulsion can take form as a rocket. Since antimatters have the highest energy density than anything in the known universe, it can provide some serious power, and can accelerate a payload to more than 20% light speed. And actually, although antimatter sound like some fancy sci-fi movie things, they're actually being produced right now. Humans are able to produce large amounts of positron, which is anti-electron, and anti-proton neutrons. They can even produce large quantities, about a few hundred thousands, of anti-hydrogen and 18 anti-helium atoms, although they soon annihilate with matters. I mean, this is fancy technology, and it might be pretty useful as well, but considering we humans can only produce a few hundred antimatter atoms at once at the moment, there's still a very long way to go. Okay, these propulsion methods are cool and futuristic, but they are cooler, more futuristic, more sci-fi styled and fast type of propulsion. It's called warp drive, hopefully you've heard it before, where it's just really famous. Star Trek, Star Wars and other famous star-related sci-fi novels and films, they're everywhere. And in real life, an idea of so-called warp drive propulsion called Alcubierre metric has been proposed in 1994, and it's planned to reach light speed. Exciting, isn't it? Well, yes, but it is very, even more so than the antimatter rocket, unrealistic. Because in theory, at least according to Mr. Einstein, you can't really reach light speed because you'll need a whole butt ton of power and energy to do it near infinite. And even if you reach light speed, there are going to be loads of time problems because you're going parallel to time, at least at the observer's perspective. You know what, we're getting too deep into the unknown here. There are just some things that even I cannot fully understand. So let's pull out of this madness and into the reality, shall we? You know, deep space explorations are crude and all, but we need to send these fancy spaceships and various parts into orbit first. For that, we'll be needing some type of transport much more efficient than a chemical rocket. Some might suggest a space elevator might be a good idea, and it is. If you don't know how a space elevator works, it's basically a super long elevator stretching all the way to geosynchronous orbit. And there are many designs for this elevator, but the components are similar. There's a base station on the ground, or above the sea, it doesn't really matter where you put your anchor point. This serves as a base for the cable, which will be attached to the ground. And this is where the capsule lands and launch. And then there's the cable. It's very long, at least 35,000 kilometers, and it needs to be strong and flexible as well, or it will break. The ideal candidate for the cable is carbon nanothread or carbon nanotubes. They are different things, okay? Then is the capsule or the climber, the part that moves and carries the payload. This is the part that's the most design freedom. It can be really big or really small. It can be powered with anything from petrol to nuclear fusion. It can have vastly different shapes. It can go in different speeds, but as long as the capsule carries payload and is safe, then it qualifies as a capsule. And the capsule is not like what you have imagined. It can release payload during the ascending process in order to reach orbits of different altitudes. At the top, there will be some sort of space station as a finishing point for the cable, and humans can payload can be offloaded to the space station. There's also going to be a counterweight for the elevator on top. It can be the space station itself if it's big enough, or it can be the cable extended to provide the same pulling force at the cable itself. A space elevator is very cheap. You can deliver something to orbit for no more than $100 per kilogram, and it's also very efficient for mass launching since multiple capsules can be used at once. Just make sure no collisions occur. It does sound like a great concept, but there are certain challenges that we must face. Safety is the number one issue. The cable is extremely thin and long, so it would be affected by wind greatly, and the material is also a problem. 
Yes, we can make carbon nanotubes in some quantity, but not as much as hundred thousand of tons. Assembling this part, or building if you prefer, is also a challenge, because you just can't launch a rocket with a cable tethered to its end and call it a day. Still, this space elevator is something that we can look forward to in about 30 years or so, so not bad. If we come back to reality, with current technology, there's also a way to make space travel and launch payloads cheaper. It is space plane, but unlike previous space planes such as the space shuttle or the Beel Run, this type of space plane uses jet engine in the atmosphere to accelerate, something about 5 Mach using ramjet or something. Then, when the plane reaches a high altitude, it uses rocket engine to travel with high speed. Once it reaches the ideal orbit, it releases payload, deorbit, and lands on a runway, just like a space shuttle. Now, this space plane plan does have some challenges to deal with, such as the technology to reach a high speed with a jet engine. Since the current fastest air breathing plane, the Blackbird, can only reach about 2.8 Mach. Fast, but not enough. And without accurate calculations, we can't be sure if this method of transport is actually cheaper than a conventional rocket. I do not know how to calculate this, so it's left to the space engineers to decide. Still, it is an interesting concept, and we might be able to see the space plane in around 15 years. After all of these fancy stuff, it is time they'll really come back to the reality. These fancy ways of space travel are cool, but we just can't see some of them in our lifetime. So why don't we work hard and wish that it might come earlier with our hard work put into it? Unfortunately, we're coming to an end of our video here. Hope you've enjoyed, make sure to smash the like and subscribe button. And don't forget to turn on the notification bell, so you won't miss any more awesome videos of mine. Thanks for watching, and see ya!